Good. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Deb and I'm a, an instructor at Hearts and Horses. Um, I've been in, well, my mentor, Steph, is in the house. She taught me how to ride. Yay, Steph! Um, put up with uh, my crying and obsessing over lesson plans and everything else and talked me out of more trees than I can count just a few years ago. And I think what's really cool about um, doing this program is that I, I remember very, very clearly and viscerally what, it, what it's like to be a new writer. Um, so many people that I work with, they're, they're amazing horsewomen and they, they've been around horses and on horses since before they could talk. And uh, I just wasn't that way. I, I got started later in life and when I fell, I fell hard, but I started out as a really, you know, scared, stressed writer. And it definitely showed in, I mean, we have the great horses out at Hearts and Horses, Mac being one of them that made me feel, you know, so much better. But um, I, I just remember that feeling. And so I'm, I'm anxious to talk to you guys a little bit about what that feels like for the writers that you work with. I, I generally work in the Changing Leads um, program. I, I used to teach a little bit more TR, but um, primarily I'm focused on changing leads, but I think the concepts that we're going to talk about really go with any writer that you're going to work with. Um, and you can just sort of, um, you know, change it around based on, on the level that your writer is and that they're working with. So um, I'll go ahead and get started with we're going to have a kind of, it's going to be a two part presentation. The first part is on promoting writer independence and how do we know, how can you support the instructor? How can the instructor support you? Um, and then the second part, it, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about managing writer stress. So when you sense your writer is getting a little stressed out, what are some tactics that we can utilize to, um, to help there? And you guys really, a lot of you guys are horse leaders and uh, you're, you're, the, you're the front line, you're the first line in, um, in the, I don't know, I hate to say it, line of defense because that's not really what we're talking about, but you're the, you're the one that's gonna be able to get that first bit of feedback and communicate it to the instructor so we can help the rider have as successful a ride as possible. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, and just, just talk a little bit about learning something new. So what I'd like to ask first is when was the last time you picked up a brand new hobby or a brand new thing to learn? And you can either put that in the chat or you can unmute yourself, but I'd love to hear about the last time you, you learned something new. Just, just give me some topics. Steph said she uh, started yoga recently, a couple days ago. Okay, so yep, that's a great example. Yoga, like horseback riding and CrossFit and some of the other things we like to do have a really steep learning curve. Anybody else? Um, it was a while back, but I joined an adult kickball league and I was never all that athletic, like in my mind, uh -huh. but my, I just never got into sports. So that was pretty scary because I didn't know what I was getting into and I didn't know if I'd be the worst one and would it be embarrassing and you know, all that stuff you think about. So basically I grabbed a couple of guy friends and made them join with me. <laughs> yeah. Worked out great. Full of security blanket. That's great. Yeah, and I've been doing it for a long time now, so. <laughs> Good, that's a great example. Anybody else? Looks like Becca well, is learning to mountain bike. Oh, okay. Oh, that's Whoa, that's though. also a steep learning <laughs> curve. <laughs> My husband has done that for a few years. And well, we started out together like 20 years ago. And then after about six months, he, I was like, nope, I'm not riding with you anymore because I basically wanted to stand flat trails and he was, he was actually mountain biking. So yeah, those are great examples. And the point of me asking you is just to remember what that feels like to be doing something that you've never done before, oftentimes in a group of people maybe that you don't know, you, you haven't developed a trust with them, 
it, it can be a little scary and at first very, it overwhelms the senses. It just, nope, Siri, I do not want to do anything. She thinks she's helping me. Um, it really does take up a ton of brain space. And I remember specifically starting out as a new writer and, you know, Steph being the awesome teacher that she was didn't overwhelm me with a billion corrections. She just, you know, allowed me to get used to the idea of being on a horse. So there's so many things that, you know, are, that go into horseback riding. Um, that there's the horse's language. They speak a totally different language than we do. And it's not just the body language, but they speak the language of pressure and resistance and all of that stuff. And it's not natural to most people to know that stuff. Most of us have to learn that at some point. How does the horse talk and communicate? So then, you know, you also have this, this little problem and blessing that the horse has its own mind about things. It's not like riding a bike where there's one brain involved. You've got two brains involved. And one of those brains is uh, a prey animal. <laughs> so they react in almost the exact opposite way of, that we do about a lot of things. And so we've got, they're speaking a different language. They, you know, they have their own mind about things. And then there's this language of writing, trot, turn, center line, uh, you know, canner, all, all these things, you know, just the saddle names, all of that stuff. And I think sometimes it's easy to forget that for writers, especially in the TR world and the CL world, their processing speed can be a lot lower or slower. And so, um, so much of that information is just, you know, overwhelming their brain and so they're up there trying to process all of this horse stuff, all of this language around riding and stuff like that. And so what you're going to do as, as a volunteer and, as, and for us as instructors is just looking for cues in our rider about what they need. Um, a lot of, and, and asking questions. What we're trying to do is avoid this information dump, this information overload that can overwhelm them to the point that they shut down. And I've seen that a lot in, in writers. And a lot of times that comes from the instructors talking to them, the horse is talking to them, they're talking to themselves inside their own brain, the volunteers talking to them. And it's just, there's a, there's a lot going on. And so in order to get to the point where we're really clued into where our writer is on an independence level, we need to ask good questions and and look for clues they're going to let us know what they're ready for if we're not overloading them with a bunch of information and really it comes down to are we their coach are we you know are we there to guide and coach them or are we um are we there to save them somehow and make sure nothing bad ever happens to them and i'd like to submit to you that we're really there in a coaching capacity, all of us. Um, this is their cool thing. Hi, Ellen. Welcome. Um, this is their... Uh, I apologize. Hi. Word gets in the way. Sorry. No worries. Not at all. Um, so they're just, you know, we're, we're there to coach and help guide. And so it, we're really going to try to take our cues from them as to where they're at um, from an independence level. Um, let me get on this next slide. Come on. Okay. So one of the ways that we can look at, um, independence is looking at levels of competence. And this is something I learned years ago in teaching, and we can probably apply this to any, any, anything that we're trying that's new. So I'm a new golfer and I, I would probably fall into the um, conscious incompetence. I'm very aware of how bad I am at golf. So we're going to go through these one at a time. Uh, the first one is called, uh, the first level is when our writers first arrive to us and, and it's called the level of unconscious incompetence. Basically, they have no idea what they don't know. Everything is new. Um, this is, 
this is the point where a lot of kids or writers can get super overwhelmed because um, there's just so much coming at them. So at this unconscious incompetence level, what we're trying to emphasize is safety first. We're not really looking to build writing skills at this point, although some of that's going to kind of come through osmosis. But we're, we're just, we as instructors and you as volunteers are trying to keep your writers safe and allow them to sort of ride this wave of um, incompetence. And it's okay. It's okay that their heels aren't down. It's okay that maybe the reins, they're not holding the reins exactly right. And you can get a lot of feedback from your instructor about what things are most important at this point. And that may change from writer to writer. For some, some writers that came in with the goal of working on balance, um, we may be working a heck of a lot on balance and those are our corrections, but we, I may not be super worried about where their hands are on the reins. Um, so, you know, your job as a volunteer there is just help with the safety piece and try not to, uh, to overwhelm them with information. This is a pretty high support level, this unconscious incompetence, because again, they don't even know what they don't know. They don't know that a horse can spook. They don't know that, you know, if they squeeze their legs a little bit too much, the horse may go faster than they want it to go. So you're there to help support with safety and, and that emotional support of encouraging and, you know, if, if everything's going to be okay, that kind of thing. So then the next level that they sort of, most learners move through from, they go from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. Now they've, they've been around the horse enough to know that they don't know everything and they don't know, they know that the horse will spook, but they don't know when the horse will spook. And they may know that the horse may go faster than they want it to, but they're not sure how to slow the horse down. And I see a lot of times, especially with me, when I started riding, this is where I started getting really, really stressed and the fear came in. So I got really afraid of riding because it, I became really aware uh, this is a really big animal and it can go really fast and I'm not sure how to control it. And so this is that I don't know what I don't know phase and it kind of frightens me. And so as a volunteer, this is where I'd like to say that this is where you're really still focusing on the safety, helping them with the safety issue, but lots of emotional support, you know, just knowing what you know about what they're going through, you're going to really try to encourage them and help them along. Again, they're sort of riding this wave as they make their way towards competence. Um, you're, you're there as a, a coach. Um, it's going to be really tempting to jump in and save them every time, but unless there's a safety issue, they may actually move towards competence a little bit faster if you stand back a little bit, ask questions, and just help them be curious about where they're at. Um, they may also be sensitive, a little bit more sensitive to criticism at this point because they think they should be a better writer than they are, um, especially people who, who are like me who want to be perfect at something the minute they start. Uh, you know, it can be very overwhelming. I don't, I don't know all of the, the ways to make my horse do what I want it to do. And I know I should be able to be going around in a left circle, but my horse keeps wanting to turn right and I get super frustrated. And so again, as coaches, you guys and, and us, we're just going to know that they're going to be a little bit sensitive to criticism and just keep, try to keep things light and encouraging them that they're going to get it. They just got to keep trying. They just got to stay with it, stay on the horse, listen to what the horse is trying to say. So this is really where as volunteers, oh, my screen, um, you guys come in and, um, you're, you're the one that's seeing cl the closest, close hand where, where the writers are at and how they're feeling at the moment. And that's going to be such an awesome help to us as instructors if you can help communicate that to us. So sometimes if in the middle of the arena, I'm not really cluing in as to where your writer is at emotionally. But in this unconscious and confidence stage, I, I need to know. I don't want to I want to push them a little bit. I don't want to push them to the point where they become discouraged and quit or become so fearful 
that they're completely shutting shutting down, which definitely can happen. As Steph knows, I've, she's like, Deb, it's time to get out of the fetal position on your horse, <laughs> sit up straight. So um, yeah, so that's the unconscious incompetence. Next part, next thing we're going to move to is conscious competence. So you can kind of see this progression. I don't know how much I don't know. I do know how much I don't know. Now I know what I know, but I'm still really thinking about it all the time. You know, I, when, when you say trot, I know how to do that, but I have to think, okay, sit up in the saddle, relax, relax my hands, take a breath, say to rot. So it's like, they're still processing everything. Um, they know how to do it, but they're there. It, it just takes them a while sometimes to, to, to get things all sorted. This is the time that I would encourage you as volunteers. And I'm encouraging myself as well as an instructor to allow them to make mistakes within the confines of safety. And your instructor can help you decide what that looks like. Um, because again, it's different for every kid. Um, you know, what safety looks like for one may, may be a little different for others. But, you know, I think, I, soapbox here, I think it's kind of a problem in our society in general with, with raising kids in schools is that we're not allowing kids to make mistakes. We just jump in and rescue them, tell them what to do, um, fix things for them. And it, I think it takes them a lot longer to reach this next level, which is going to be the unconscious competence level, because they're not having to think and be invested and have agency in their own success. And so, you know, making mistakes is the best way to learn. We all know that. That's how we all grew up is having to make those mistakes. And so this is I think the hardest part for volunteers and instructors is to allow for failure. Um, it's super hard to not jump in there and, you know, try to fix the problem that they're having with the horse. But let's remind ourselves, they know how to do it. They just need to figure out how to put all the pieces together in their brain and, and, and put it together. And they're going to learn it a lot faster if they, if they, they do that experientially. So this is for volunteers, more of a medium to low support. Um, different days, different skills are probably going to change uh, how much involvement you have um, with helping them be independent. Um, but this is time to start stepping back a little bit. And now you're going to start seeing from the instructors a little bit more of a skill correction. So whereas in those first two phases, I'm not worried so much about the skill. I'm more worried about learning horsemanship and learning, you know, how do I not be afraid? How do I just get the basics going? But here's where we might start seeing, hey, you know, we need to balance a little bit better. We're going to put some weight in our heels. We're going to hold those reins correctly um, and start challenging them because though now the skills can help them with their progression because because they already know the they already know the the language around it it's not going to be completely overwhelming all right so then the the last natural phase which gosh we all hope we get to at some point with something that we're pursuing is unconscious competence i don't even have to think about what i know it just comes naturally to me the muscle memory is there you know when i first started writing with Steph and years ago, I was, you know, way in the, you know, the beginning. Now I'm an unconsciously competent writer. I can hop on my horse. I was out on a trail ride with my dad last weekend and uh, a bike snuck up on us and my little horse bolted straight right. And I just, I did, I did the right things without even thinking about it. Like I was still on and we were safe. And I, I don't know, really know how it happened because seven years ago, I probably would have fallen off and had to chase my horse down the trail. But I just, my muscles kind of do the right thing now. And so this is kind of the point where we're going to actually see riders start grabbing out of the Hearts and Horses program because they probably need even bigger challenges than we can provide for them there. But this, as a volunteer, this is where you may step back and just enjoy watching the rider that you've been working with, I, you know, park it, go sit down. You're sitting there holding the lead rein and you're, 
you're sitting on the um, on the steps and you're getting to enjoy the fruits of your labor. They don't have a lot of needs at this point, other than you know a fan club. Um, and, and it's just a really cool, it's cool to be able to see a writer progress to that level. All right, so um, if, are there any questions on, on writer independence? What, what your role could be in that, promoting it? You can unmute yourself if you, oh, I think we might have. One more. Hello, Marilyn, welcome. All right, so if, if we're in the writer independence piece, and again, I hope, I, I hope you weren't coming here for uh, black and white answers because really, it depends. It depends on the writer, it depends on the day, Depends on the whole session are, but this is a great thing to talk to your instructor about before class. Um, a lot of times we're rushing around, you know, trying to get everything ready, but really like our number one job there is to help writers succeed. So stop us for a second and say, hey, where would you say my writer is like competence wise? Do you think they're, they're, they don't know what they're doing? Do you think they're really ready for some challenges? And how can I support in that area? I can tell you, me and every instructor that I know would be would welcome that sort of help from you guys um, because we really do want the writers to to be successful and the goal is independence you know for for every writer at whatever level whatever that looks like for them um, yeah all right so any questions then on on competence and independence I think it was really helpful to get that new style of email that Emmy's doing with like your course and writer and instructor intro and that whole thing you guys are doing I mean it's you know I've been here a little while now but I know that for new people especially that would be really helpful to keep everything straight in your head and um mm -hmm. a picture of the animals I like to <laughs> but um but yeah the info the basic rundown of you know the writers even though I knew them sort of it's just it's nice to have that quick summary um like I used to always ask the instructors in the beginning when it was a new writer like what's their background or whatever makes it big. Yeah. There's a couple of times I can remember specifically where if there was just one thing I would have known about the writer, it would have um, helped mm -hmm. you a yeah. little bit better. Like, oops, I wouldn't have said that or something like that. Something really very specific um, and probably yeah. minor. But yeah, so that stuff's really helpful. Awesome. Great. The and hope is in non-COVID times to do that in person so we can all meet together as a volunteer team and all talk about yeah. those writers ahead of time too. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. And again, feel free to, to grab the instructor or email them. Um, you, you guys, I, I, so I started out writing at Hearts and Horses and then I became a volunteer. And so I was a horse leader at Hearts and Horses for a few years before I got certified. And I, I was, because I live so far away, I was only out there a day or two a week. So I had, I only had like maybe three or four writers that I worked with and I obsessed about them all through the week. And so you guys really know your writers best. You likely know them even better than I do as an instructor. And so now as an instructor, I may have 20 writers that I'm working with, or in the case of like people like Rachel, 50, I mean, it used to be not, not any, you know, during this, these phases, but a lot of us have so, so many writers that everybody gets kind of, they can get kind of turned around in my mind. So feel free, you know, if you've got some thoughts on a writer, if you feel like, boy, they seem to be shutting down because this challenge is too hard, or maybe they, they, they're getting bored, please, 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 we would love that information, you know, outside of class time and, and to be able to, to work on a plan. And I can, you know, can help with uh, helping you figure out where they are competence wise and what you can do best to support them. So that was a great point. Good. Yeah, All right, so we're going to go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Ask about, so Carter um, is, is a writer that um, I just met in, on Saturday, and he's uh, wheelchair bound. And um, he, 
I just need to figure out, we need to figure out how to make him feel comfortable because he was very nervous, mm -hmm. you know, when he got on and uh, we had the sidewalkers and very secure, but he kept, you know, wanting to make sure, are you holding me? And then, and then his arms, he, you know, he doesn't have a lot of mobility. His arms still work, but they're not real strong. And so he got tired really quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, needed, he, he left sooner than before the class was over. Um, sure. I just, I just, how do we, how do we make him trust us, the sidewalkers and the horse leader? I'm the horse yeah. leader. That's a great point. We're getting ready to, that's a great transition because we're going to talk a little bit about managing rider stress. Um, but just, just know that that's completely and totally normal. And a little bit of stress isn't too bad. It actually builds resilience in us as humans. Now, does he have uh, some cognitive issues as well or are they mostly physical okay yeah he's as sharp as can be and he can tell great exactly how he's yeah he's 14 that's awesome uh, but he's uh i think he's been emmy could answer this he's been at hearts and horses for a while um and and brenda was saying that she has seen the decline in his mobility uh -huh. um but yeah uh, just wanting he, he didn't smile he didn't enjoy it, you know? Yeah, so the, um, yeah, that's hard. And I think this next section that we're gonna to get to on managing writer stress will be helpful because it really, it may be a little bit more applicable to uh, writers who don't have um, cognitive delays um, because most of, the, most of the kids I work with are in the Changing Leads program and they have trauma history. so there's almost always fear associated with trying something new that they don't have 100% control over. Um, and again, just, are, are you a rider, a horseback rider? Well, I used to be, but as a matter of fact, I'm gonna start lessons tomorrow. I'm oh, good. Yeah, my Great. first lesson with Liz is tomorrow morning. So awesome, oh, lucky <laughs> you. Ellen, I don't know if you saw the part in the beginning. Hi, Ellen. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Shannon. Um, I don't know if you saw the part in the beginning because of work about overwhelming them, and I wasn't in your class, but I don't know if maybe he was a little bit like everybody's coming at him with info from the left and the right and the front and the back, and he, mm -hmm. they want staring at them, and they're going to mess up, or I don't know if that was the case or not, or if it's just being new and being nervous. Well, that you know, not being overwhelmed is a thing. I don't. He got, I, you know, and I did miss the first 10 minutes and I apologize because okay. of corporate job. Ugh. So, I, <laughs> so I could do everything. Else. That's why I just wanted to mention it because I know you might not. Yeah, have that yeah much. this, but, is, this will be recorded. Been, so, it, but you know, he had to be, he, I don't think he had used the, um, the, the what's lift. It called? The lift. The lift. Yeah. yeah. And maybe that was new to him, but I, I don't know. But every, you know, we had several people or, Rhonda was there. We had several people around and helping and um, maybe eventually he'll see it as fun like a ride before the ride or something. I hope so. I hope so. I mean another thing to consider is that sometimes we can mistake focus and concentration for disappointment or or stress or sadness. Um, so you know, sometimes there's just, they are just focusing so much, especially with a, a physical need that's causing them to feel uncomfortable in the saddle or unbalanced. They may just be really focusing and it's, it's not, it's not the fun that you often see with like the little five-year-olds that get up there and they're just going round and round. And so it could be a little bit of that. And then it could, it could truly be kind of like a stress response. So let's go into a little bit of the stress response. And just a reminder to everyone, this is gonna be recorded and put on the website, I believe. So if you wanna go back and, and look at the, the competence levels a little bit later, you can. So we talked a little bit, uh, Ellen had a great example of, of stress showing up in, in her writer in the form of just not seeming like they were having fun. Um, what, what other ways do you sense stress in your writers or have you in the past? Feel free to jump in. What does it look like? Mm 
Well, I, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to jump in. If no I think I have a little it. delay here. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Ellen. Oh, no, you go. You go, Shannon. Oh, um, I'm thinking of uh, sometimes they get a little like hyper, like amped up. Like when you get, mm -hmm. open, you just kind of, you know, you're kind of like a horse, like your eyes are darting and your body's kind of all over the place and you're tense and that whole thing. Yeah, good one. Well, and with Carter, he just, you could see it, because I do the same thing, tighten up through the face, you know, and, and mm -hmm. he, I think he was focusing, but he was using all his strength to hold on to the, the horn, you know, of the saddle. And, um, and he kept saying, you know, slow down, slow down. He really wanted Mac to walk very, very slow. Yeah. And Mac wanted to walk a little bit faster, but, yeah. uh, you know, so, and I kept asking. And Mac is a, is he's okay? a big, tall horse. Um, one of the taller horses we have out there. And I can tell you that it can be really stressful just being that high off the ground, especially if you don't have, 100% control of your body. Um, yeah. You really do feel like you're at the mercy of the horse, the horse leader, and the sidewalkers. Um, and, you know, that stress can often then transfer to the horse. It's, Mac sounds like a perfect horse for him because Mac's not as reactive to that. He tends to just kind of take it in and let it flush out. Um, there are other horses that are, that would definitely not appreciate that level of stress in the rider, but it, they do a pretty good job of matching, matching horses up. Um, yeah, and I have seen stress in, in other ways, like kids that can be a little bit hyperactive and unfocused. Um, kids that completely shut down, they won't talk or they talk too much. It, it, it shows up in lots of different ways. Um, a lot of times in the body, and sometimes it's, it's showing up in the body in ways that transfer to the horse and we don't even really know what's happening. It's just that the horse is acting bad all of a sudden. <laughs> the horse keeps trying to go to the middle. The horse keeps trying to break into a trot. The horse keeps stopping when they're being told to go. A lot of times these are unseen stress responses that they're getting from, from the rider. So maybe the, the rider is shutting down their seat because they're really afraid or they've even had maybe sexual abuse and that's uncomfortable. And so the horse is like feeling that, like, I don't see it. You guys don't see it. The horse knows though. And so they they, they may stop walking and then the kid gets upset. They get maybe even more tense and then the horse really won't walk. And so sometimes stress can show up, not necessarily in the rider that we can see, but it's showing up in the horse. And I, I almost always will give horses the benefit of the doubt in class. Um, if a horse is acting in a way that's a little bit out of character for them, I al I'm always curious as, as to why. What, what's going on? What messages are they hearing that maybe I'm not hearing? And that's you know time to just be curious and start investigating a little bit. Um, one of the things that I've noticed as, as an instructor is that a lot of times, not only is the, the horse mirroring the stress of the rider, but the volunteer is mirroring the stress of the rider. Because you guys want to do your best out there. You want to make this the best experience possible for, for these uh, riders. And so you start mirroring their, their whatever they're dealing with. Um, and, you know, let's talk about how that might just sort of make things go in a bad spiral. It really, it, it's not helpful, but we just do it unconsciously. We're empathic beings. You know, we, we feel that stress and that sadness or the anger that a kid is feeling or a writer's feeling. And then we, we start getting stressed out too. And so I think it's important to, to think about managing your own stress and not just in the moment that you're in class, but just all, all week round, and especially the day of. You know, we all know from being around horses that um, they, they do mirror how we're feeling. And so that horse is looking to you as the leader to see if everything's okay. And so 
really trying to ground yourself before you go into class. Maybe, you know, if you've got a kid who tends to be super high in the stress category, maybe like go into one of the offices and just do like a little mini breathing, grounding exercise, get yourself in a really good place where you're, you're ready to be present with that rider and be the coach and the support and the fan club that they need and you don't get sucked into their stress. So you're focusing on your own self-care, making sure you're doing the things that, that you need to do every day to make sure you're in, the, in a good space to be able to help your riders. And I put espresso because for me, having a nice cup of coffee before I go in is helpful or, you know, you're, you're getting out with friends, you're, you're doing stuff other than hearts and horses, you know, we, we, the thing that brings us out to hearts and horses can also be the thing that burns us out of hearts and horses, which is this desire to help. We're very empathic. We want to do, do, do help, help, help. And we're not really taking care of ourselves, but you know, the old saying of putting your own oxygen mask on applies here first. You need to be practicing your own good self-care, um, being really present in the moment while you're there um, and, and thinking, catching yourself and where, where your emotions are at the moment. So, you know, and even maybe doing a body check. Am I holding tension in my shoulders? Am I getting wound up into this? Um, what does my face look like to my writer? I think about this a lot with my kids, you know, sometimes if I'm cooking dinner or something and they come in and they want something, I may look at them and say, what? It, it, I, don't, I don't mean to be mean, but it comes off mean rather than imagining what, what do I look like on the other side of that response. So just thinking about your body, your face, how are you expressing uh, a lack of stress to your rider so that they can maybe mirror how you're feeling, you know, taking those deep breaths, relaxing your shoulders, laughing, you know, um, and leaving your problems at the door. I mean, that sounds a little bit harsh, but mostly that just means be present. You know, there's a lot going on in the world right now. And we have a real gift at Hearts and Horses that we can just go to this. It's like, you know, it's like a fairyland to me. When, when I go in there, the world just disappears and it requires such focus that I feel better when I leave than when I got there because I've just been able to go an hour or two hours totally focused on, on one thing and you're going to be better for it. Your rider's going to be better for it and the horses will definitely get better for it. So are there any, oh, here we go. So how to help. So what can we do in the moment? What are some like little tools that we can come up with that, that could help our riders in the moment if they're feeling stressed or scared? The, one of the first things I'd like to encourage you to do is validate how they're feeling um, and maybe even repeat it back to them. So ask them the question or if they express, I'm really scared or I don't like doing this or you know, any of those sorts of things, repeat that back. So what I'm hearing is that you're feeling afraid right now. Is that right? And a lot of times just knowing that someone heard you and that they're listening brings down the cortisol levels. Um, I, I, I think a lot of times in a desire to be helpful, we'll say, no, 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 there's nothing to be scared about. Don't be afraid. This is the best horse ever. This horse would never buck you off. And I, I get that. But first of all, we don't know that for sure because horses are horses. You don't make a promise about a horse because a horse has its own mind and you don't know that they, they won't, wouldn't do that thing. And then you've lost trust with your rider if something bad does happen. But second of all, it's, you know, it's like, it's not helpful to be told that what you're feeling is not actually true because whether or not it's true, they perceive it to be true. And so it's true. Um, and one of the things we can talk, talk to them about is naming the emotion that they're feeling. We work on this a ton in the changing leads program because a lot of these trauma kids don't they don't have any words for how they're feeling. They just know how it feels in their body. So we work a lot on uh, naming the emotion. There's been some scientific studies that have shown that 
just naming the emotion as close as possible to the actual emotion that it is brings down cortisol levels. So if, if, you, if a kid says, I'm sad, that's an emotion. But maybe we can narrow it down to disappointed or um, maybe if they say, I'm afraid, maybe that, that might be something more specific might be, I'm, I'm worried that I'm going to fall off the horse or that I'm not going to succeed. So the closer we can get to the actual emotion, the more that's going to bring the stress level down. So don't be afraid. It's not like you're going to tell them, oh, you're fearful. And that, so it's, now they're going to be fearful. That's not really what I'm talking about. It's just listening and help them narrow down what emotion that they're feeling. And it really does help. And then that goes back to the validate, you know, wow, I can see how that, that's scary for you. And, and I'm sorry that you feel that way. And you don't have to fix it. That's not, fixing it is not, it may temporarily bring down the stress level, but it's not going to help them get to that conscious or unconscious confidence very fast. You can always ask them if they need a break and communicate that with the instructor. I know that um, sometimes, you know, I've taken lessons with Liz too, and there's like two or three riders that I ride with that are other instructors that are a lot better than me. And sometimes it's super stressful to try to keep up with everyone. And so Liz has been great. She'll notice that I might be getting a little wound up or stressed out. And she'll say, why don't you head to the other side of the arena, work on something else for a second, and then come back. And so there's always those sorts of options. If you have, a, I'd, I'd rather have a kid doing something else than shutting down and not getting anything out of the lesson. So if they need a break, they should ask for it. And it's great practice in advocating for yourself. Um, another little tactic that we work with in changing leads is this see, hear, smell. Uh, it's, it's getting into your senses. Um, name, name five things you see. Name five things you can hear. Name five things you can smell or two things you can smell. And what that does is it gets you out of your sort of reaction, fear, reptile brain into your thinking brain. It, it's like triggers a little switch in the brain that helps, helps you start thinking and, and not react so much. So that really has worked with a lot of our kids, especially kids with trauma histories, because they get into some emotion, especially fear or anger, and they start spiraling. Um, and really what they're doing is they're, they're reacting in their, their reptile brain. It's the fight or flight instinct. And just getting into their senses, asking them what they can see, hear, and smell gets them out of that fight or flight response and back into the moment. Um, and it, it really, it just works really, really well. And then, you know, again, just don't, don't judge how they're feeling. It's, it's their feeling and that's, it's perfectly all right to, to feel that way. So that is a little bit on stress. Do you guys have um, any more thoughts around stress or questions about anything we've done so far or any light bulb moments or things that you think, wow, this is something I can definitely put into practice with my writers? Yeah, absolutely. I can, I'm going to use quite a, yeah, a lot of this with Carter because, you know, I just want to, I want to know how he's feeling, you know, I want to see if I can, um, and then Brenda's also, she's, she's brainstorming on what we can do so his arms won't get so tired, but he was holding mm -hmm. stress in his arms. Um, so yes, I want him to feel Good. more comfortable and trust us and relax. And yeah. One of the things that I've forgotten to mention is sometimes it's helpful to point out what they're doing well, because they can become so hyper-focused on, on the corrections and, the, and their fears that they don't realize that they oh really God. are doing a lot that's great. I mean, just getting on a horse when you have that sort of physical disability is a major exercise in courage and bravery. And every person that gets on a horse, period, deserves commendation for being brave, but especially people who 
don't have 100% control of their bodies. And so maybe even just saying, I'm so proud of you for coming back this week and getting on this horse. I know it, it can be tiring and, and a little bit scary and, and they're doing awesome. Especially okay. if there's other riders that are maybe a little bit more competent in class, they, they'll be comparing themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. So helping them focus on what they're doing right. And that it, horseback riding is a massive learning curve for anybody, you know? And so just taking it day by day, getting what little bit we can out of it at the moment um, is valuable. So good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts? This Hi. is, can you hear me? Yes. This is Marilyn. I'm Hi. really fairly new, but last year I did work with uh, Changing Leads program and with this little girl who was very anxious. Hmm. Was it helpful to share with her um, that my, the way, um, because I, that's one thing I work with, uh, deal with, have dealt with in my uh, life. And so I kind of, I, uh, I don't know if it was helpful or not to say, I totally understand what you're feeling because I've been there, I've done that. And, and I'd say, well, I used to, the way I handle it is take deep breaths and things like that. Um, but how much do you share of your own story? I'm sure wow. that's, because it's not about us, it's about them. Sure. Well, I mean, it sounds to me like you've already got that awareness and that's, that's the thing is to, to be, aware that it is about them. But a lot of these kids feel really alone. They feel like freaks and weirdos, you know, because they're the only kid they know whose dad's in jail. They're the only mm -hmm. kids they know whose mom's on drugs. Uh, they are the only kid they know that doesn't sleep at night because they're anxious. And so to hear from a functioning adult who's actually doing well in life that they've struggled with anxiety too, I think can be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like that doesn't have to, you don't have to go into the, the gory details, but I think you handled that, that really well. And, and those, those strategies that you can help pass off, I think are awesome, you know, um, because you're, again, when you're a changing leads volunteer, often they trust and listen to you more than they even do me. Um, and so if you can tell them to take deep breaths, they may actually listen to you. Whereas with me, it's, they're just be like, that's not going to work. I'm not going to try that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think sharing little bits of, of your life and, and our changing lead volunteers are so amazing and they've really shown themselves to be, I really like it. <laughs> yeah, you guys are, are a, a different breed and not everyone <laughs> likes to do that. But if you're the type that doesn't mind opening up and being vulnerable to these kids, it can really make a massive difference in their life because they just haven't had anybody like that who, you know, will admit that they, they've struggled, but yet they're, they seem to be doing okay. It's not the end of the world and things do get better. So, um, no, it sounds to me like you handled that really well. One other thing, I really liked what you said about validating their feelings because so easy, I want to be a fix it and solve it. And oh, I'm anxious or I'm, or I'm afraid. Oh, there's nothing to be afraid about. Uh, no, yeah. thank you for giving me or helping see how valuable it is to say, oh, I hear that you're, is that what you would say to them? I, I, I hear that, you, that you're not, that you're afraid right now. Mm -hmm. but, but give me some other, other ways to respond to that to validate their feelings? Well, let's see, we had, you know, a, a lot of times that comes up with, um, with fear because it, uh, a kid will say, and, and sometimes they don't say I'm afraid, They're, they just refuse to try whatever it is we're doing. Um, they refuse to trot or they start maybe getting a little angry or pushing back on something. They start turning their anger, anger towards the horse. So they don't say, uh, I'm afraid of doing this or I'm, I'm, it's not working for me. They'll just start acting out. So they're, these are not, a lot of these kids are not super in touch with their feelings. So part of it is helping them get in touch and helping them name that emotion that they're feeling. Um, those of you who are changing leads volunteers know we use the mood meter, which has the, the four quadrants. There's the red, the yellow, the green, and the blue feelings. 
Um, and if you don't have that, I'm sure Tamara, or I could get that to you. And it's just full of emotion, like emotion words. And they relate to how that energy feels in your body. So red emotions are sort of hot, negative feeling emotions like anger, disgust, um, fears in there. And then, uh, the blue emotions are kind of like feeling blue, like they're low energy, negative feeling emotions. So depression, tired, um, those kinds of things. And so if you don't have that chart, I mean, you can even find it online. It's called the mood meter and it has a million different names for, for emotions. So helping them kind of tune in, is your energy high or low? Is it a good feeling or a bad feeling? Sometimes kids are just hyper. They're, they're excited. They ate 14 candy bars on the way over. And so it may be, they're just, they just have like a body stress response from all the sugar that they had, or they didn't have their medication. So helping them name that emotion. And then once they name it, you just basically say it back to them. So it sounds to me like you're feeling uh, depressed about, you know, your grandma dying this week. Is that right? And then they say, yes. And you say, wow, that, that must be tough. And I'm sorry. And that's, that's it. You don't really have to do anything more. Just naming it and validating it is, is, is good. Right. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember, oops, TV just went off, um, to remember to be careful not to tell them what they're feeling or assume. Yes. Sometimes you phrase it like, you know, they're reacting however, and you're just going, I know you're probably afraid right now, but right. some people will get upset about that and they'll be like, I'm not afraid. Yes. Like, you know what I mean? So maybe something like, maybe you're feeling afraid would be better than you're probably feeling afraid, you know, mm -hmm. careful not to tell them, but maybe ask or suggest or, or just with the whole, you know, focusing on something else can be really. Yeah. And there, there, yeah, there are some kids that really aren't ready to talk about their emotions and that's okay. This is more for the kids who are kind of ready to go there and they're maybe a little bit more in tune. Other kids, maybe they just need to ground themselves by, getting in their body. What are you feeling? What is the horse doing right now? Um, what do you think the horse is telling you when it does X, Y, and Z? So it's not always about talking about our feelings. Um, again, depending on the class, some of the TR classes are definitely not feelings oriented. Um, so those might be more of just helping them get grounded without necessarily talking about their feelings. But if you do have a writer that expresses an emotion, it's important to to validate that. So good. All right. Is there any, anything else that you guys wanted to chat about with all this info? Oh, I also think it's really great when like the instructor or the volunteer points out to the kids that this is their time, like mm. something like a lot of these kids don't have a lot of ownership in their lives. They might not have their own, you know, they might be switching schools or not have their own room or their own stuff or whatever. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. someone mentions the fact that this is yours, own it, you know, and yes. just look it up. This, this horse is only here for you and I'm here for you. And, you know, really, because they get distracted a lot. Whereas if they spent the hour <laughs> outside and bonding with the horse, which obviously they get to eventually, um, you know, they get more out of it when they get to that point where they can focus inside. And so I think yeah. it's, someone said that one time that like, this is your time. And I thought that's perfect. They need that. They need ownership. So true. Keep standing up for themselves and be like, Hey, this is mine. You know, I think it makes yes. sense. Good. And that's a great reminder for all of us that really that's what we're there for. We're not there for ourselves or for, you know, any other reason to help them be successful. So that's a, that's a great point. Good, good. Well, thank you guys so much for coming and for what you do out there. I, I, I mean, you guys hear it all the time. We could not do the job without you. And that's the volunteers are the heart and blood of our program. And I, as an instructor, who's also a former volunteer, I, I kind of know what it feels like. Sometimes you feel super appreciated. Other times you feel like, is anybody listening to me to take care hear what I have. And I just want you to know we do. Sometimes we're busy and we may forget to tell you, but you're so appreciated. And the, we have the best volunteers 
in the world. And it's part, it's part of the reason they'll never get rid of me out at Hearts and Horses is you guys and the friendships I've developed there. So I think you actually, you guys actually you. do a really great job of that so far compared to a lot of places that I've volunteered. Um, I think that's a, a, it's good. We get uh, positive little comments and stuff and it's great to hear just like with the writers. Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we need it too. We're human. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, unless there's anything else you guys had, that's all I've got. And I really appreciate you guys showing up today. And you can let other people know that weren't able to get on that that the video will be on the website. Good.